these bits fit together to make a bassoon in theory my daughter always had a fancy for learning to play a bassoon but it's not the sort of instrument to you buy on a whim they are somewhat complex and very expensive to buy and then one day she was at a village fete and on the stall there was one mark fifty quid now the lady on the stall did say that it didn't work and it didn't fit together and that she'd sent it to uh, a repairer who took one look at it and said it would cost so much money to repair it it wouldn't be worth it so my daughter knowing that I've repaired and serviced instruments over the years as daughters do dad will fix it which is why it's here on my table well I found why it didn't fit together because it's not just one bassoon it's a marriage of two possibly three this bit is completely a different colour from the other three bits and this one nearly matches so perhaps it is just two bassoons anyway they didn't fit but I've managed to uh, fiddle and twiddle and get the bits to go together and uh, it doesn't really work very well I replaced several of the pads and bent a bit here and fitted one or two things and my daughter bought herself a new uh, proper reed and they're not cheap um, and then she discovered that like a lot of the bassoons you need a really big hand to cover all the holes and key work when you play it and I understand now that she, what she needed really is what's called a, a short reach bassoon so I said the alternative then is to now that it's in a sort of working condition is to either sell it back on eBay and try and get your money back or I can turn it into a floor lamp and then we can put it back on eBay and ask a silly price because after all there can't be too many floor lamps made out of bassoons in the world and maybe there aren't too many people who want a bassoon turned into a lamp anyway anyway that's what I'm gonna do she liked the idea and she wants to keep it so that's my job making a bassoon into a floor lamp making this video uh, was a bit of an afterthought because I've already made a start on it and the obvious place to start is the base I got some lumps of this uh, Iroko or Utile or Utile or whatever it is however you pronounce it a hardwood that uh, replaces uh, modern mahogany I suppose anyway I managed to get three lumps and tongued and grooved and glued them all together um, hacked out a circle and turned them up in my lathe I don't have a, a woodworker's lathe so they had to go in my engineer's lathe and fortunately I've got a, um, an 11 inch swing uh, and these three bits uh, turned out to be a circle around ten and a half inches so it worked out quite well uh, a little disappointed in the finish uh, after I'd stained it this piece here went very dark and uh, I think the wood is probably rotten but it's quite hard but it soaked up the, the stain and whereas the normal piece didn't it repelled it anyway I don't suppose anybody's going to notice too much about the base uh, when they look at the rest of the uh, lamp now while it was on the lathe I turned up the inside as well um, it, it needs a heavy weight and it really is heavy now it weighs about 10 pounds 
uh, and I cast a lead weight in an old flan tin. Uh, I was a bit worried that the lead might stick to the flan, but uh, the flan tin, but that didn't matter because uh, I left enough space to put the whole screw the whole lot in. Um, but as it happened, the lead began to shrink as it cooled, and it came away from the flan pin tin quite easily. So the inside is uh, turned out, and I drilled three holes in the lead, which was about half an inch thick. And if you've ever drilled lead, well, that's a great way to break drills. If you've never drilled it before, go slowly and make sure you clear the flutes because it, it breaks quite the biggest of drills I can assure you. Anyway, it, I screwed it in, it's firmly fixed in the base. Um, and now on the top here, uh, I've got to fit the, the bottom section and this cap, uh, that's the bit that fits into on the bottom of this uh, base piece of the bassoon. Um, that just fits in nicely. But of course it's not very secure on its own. So it needs some support and I've made these two brass um, struts. The hole in here in the center uh, that's quite a job to get because it did, this el elliptical hole doesn't seem to match anything uh, mathematically. I measured it as carefully as I could and in the end uh, came up with a roughly accurate, as accurate as I could make it and I see and see a, a half inch hole in depth. Now it's not, it, this is not flat so it's glued in position I didn't want to make any screw holes in it. I don't want to spoil the instrument in any way. So that's glued quite firmly in. And these two brass struts I'm using this part of the um, this is where the thumb piece support screws in to to hold the instrument uh, when you're playing it. So I'm using that um, to attach these brass rods to. Uh, a bit of a problem with the brass rods in that you've got to be drilled through uh, at an awkward angle uh, a double angle really because you've got to come in from this direction uh, as well as an angle here there's an angle on the inside however uh, it's amazing what you can do with uh, uh, careful eyesight and lining up and it does match uh, quite well and at the top end uh, of the support just here um, the brass rods are half lapped and uh, silver soldered together so now that will screw in like that and when I screw the thumb piece into there which is uh, an interesting shape uh, and that should screw nicely into the into the hole when I get it lined up there we are and it even has a locking ring on it and now that's really secure and it's not going to get knocked over. Now at the base here um, to stop the rods just slipping up and down inside the wooden container, the wooden base, uh, I've had to solder on two brass 
rings which I've turned up and of course they don't sit nicely in uh, fl flat they've got to be counterboard now I didn't have a counterborer uh, not that size anyway but uh, so I had to make one and they're quite easy to make yeah, it's uh, just a piece of uh, steel uh, bore a hole through and then you file these four opposing flats on it and so it gets a, a sharp edge um, I use DN8 which is a high carbon steel um, then heat it red hot stick it in water and it hardens it um, uh, I didn't bother to temper it because when I put the rod through and silver soldered it in probably the heat from the silver soldering uh, tempered it but it didn't matter because I'm only cutting wood and that that did the job so these are now flush fitting on this side and nice and sunk into the wood on that side and that sort of completes the base so now it's I think it's going to be uh, the job's going to be the wiring as a floor lamp it's going to be rather short it could do with being quite a bit taller although it's a big instrument it's not going to be a very tall lamp and as you can see there are two two holes because uh, the bassoon is really a big U-tube um, this is the the bend at the bottom where the airflow comes down round and back up again and so what I've decided is that on the tallest side which will be this one um, it's going to be an up lighter uh, look much better I think than one with the, with the light casted downwards and, and this one that's going to be um, another light uh, the idea being to be um, uh, a reading lamp but that's going to be a bit on the low side and I'm not quite sure how I'm going to do that yet but at the moment it's a question of, of the wiring now I don't want to spoil the integrity of the machine of the bassoon so first of all I've got to get wire down one down each side for each lamp and I've also got to get the the cable in to to supply the power so it wants to go through a hole in the in the instrument and there's plenty of holes to choose from and the nearest one is going to be underneath that key there um, so I'll take the key off and then it can go through there and this YouTube look is only held in with these little thumb screws and it's quite easy to remove these like that and the YouTube will come off and then all the wires will come down I can solder them together um, and then put the YouTube back again and then the wiring will be complete and that's going to be the next job uh, replacing the pads on a clarinet or a, a flute are pretty straightforward um, once you've done it you have to make sure that they seal all round and that's done with a feeler uh, of some sort. Um, usually it's a, a strip of, of a, um, a cigarette paper like a Rizzler and then you can put it underneath the pad and give it a tug and you can check all round a hole to see that it's, the pad is sealing alright but when you come to a bassoon that's a different kettle of fish this one for instance has got an oval shaped hole which goes into this side this tube on this side but there's a little tiny hole here and it goes into this side what on earth that little hole is for I don't know but all I can imagine is that it must be 
a tuning hole or something, but it must affect the, the quality of the sound somehow. I couldn't remove the um, uh, key completely, got wedged under the other one. But the interesting thing is that this key is operated from the other side with this little bar. If I can get hold of it. A little tiny bar, can't get hold of it, that goes right through to the other side. It's a strange instrument. Uh, the wires are all soldered together um, and I've double shrink wrapped them so it should be okay. It's just now a question of feeding the, the uh, cables through and putting the uh, YouTube back on. two thumb screws back in again that's the the rod that goes through And that should complete the job. And that's the wiring complete. So I can put it in the stand. screw in and that uh, pretty well completes the job except for one thing And that's the holding the cable down. Um, I'll have to make a little cleat uh, to go on there so that uh, there's no danger of it being pulled and damaging it. But otherwise, this Bates unit is now finished. I'll have to think about the cleat because uh, I don't want any little plastic thing from commercial so I'll make one to, suitable to go with it. The CNC mill uh, is a very versatile machine apart from uh, the usual big stuff it will also engrave. <coughs> now I know engraving machines work at something like 30,000 rpm it's perfectly possible to engrave, providing you've got the software, um, at 2000 RPM, which is what I'll run this at. 
Um, providing that you slow the feed rate right down. Now the feed rate is on this one I've set at 200 millimeters a minute and the plunge rate 100 millimeters a minute. The cutter is 60 degrees. the block in position I've just used super glue. It's an excellent method of, of holding small objects um, to something like a piece of steel or so that you can hold it in the vise. At the end to get it off it won't come off easily. I shall have to use heat and quite a high heat too to break the this particular type of uh, super glue. Lettering height is a uh, millimetre and a half. I thought I'd use the back of the cleat as a, a nameplate and put the date on just, just because I can. I can't get any closer with my camera. It's only an ordinary camera. Lumex. time it withdraws to a, a safe height uh, before it comes down to the next cut. I think I've set that unnecessarily high. A couple of millimetres would have been enough for engraving. But I think it's, I've set it at six.
and that's it. And this is the uh, the back of the cleat. Uh, it's it's just a simple zigzag to put a kink in the flex. Not very deep. And on the other side is the engraving, and I just filled it in with a little bit of black paint and uh, lacquered over the top, and that completes the job. That's the finished cleat. Brass screws, of course, but care needs to be taken putting brass screws into hardwood, so easy to shear them off. This is the top joint um, to which I am going to attach somehow uh, the bulb holder. Now, the hole in the end that's um, 41 millimeters across and it's also got a slight taper on it. <coughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn up a piece of that same hardwood and uh, make a brass fitting which will screw into here and uh, hopefully complete the job. Okay, it's uh, drilled and it's quite a nice press fit not too tight. I don't want to split the wood or anything. I had to hold it by hand to drill it. I couldn't uh, find any other way of doing it. Uh, not without damaging the surface. I've turned up the uh, little brass adapter. I was surprised to find that that's not a metric thread, it was an imperial imperial half inch 26 which is a bit annoying because all my brass stock was 12 mil but I found a nub end um, which I've turned down and that screws in quite nicely and there's a flush fit and there will be a push fit in there. I'll push it right down after I've um, stained and lacquered that. Then that completes that side. It'll just be a question of wiring in. I went to a great deal of trouble to turn up a block of this uh, Iroko into a nice round bar that I could put in the top here and extend it. But when I finished it, it looked so bad I ended up cutting it off short and just leaving this little piece instead which looks much better. Uh, this is where the bocal fits, the mouthpiece goes in that hole there um, like so but it's only three feet off the floor at the moment so that's nowhere near uh, enough height for a, a reading lamp it needs to come be extended so I've got to make an extension uh, which will fit in there that won't look out of place uh, this is the uh, extension I thought it would be uh, a good idea if it matched the colour as far as possible uh, of the bassoon um, it took uh, two different spirit uh, stains one red mahogany and the other dark mahogany uh, but it's a pretty good match I'm quite pleased with that but to also to make it look more realistic I, I, the idea was that it would be um, a look as though it should be there as that it's part of the instrument itself and anybody who doesn't know what a bassoon looks like um, would think that it is part of the instrument itself because the other end uh, has these ferrules on and it matches. The only thing is I, when I made the ferrules uh, they are made of brass and all the metal on the instrument uh, is a white metal or nickel plated or something like that and uh, so the ends um, I've silvered them. This is done with 
the same stuff the clock repairers do when they resilver uh, antique clock things like uh, a grandfather clock chapter ring and so on uh, are silvered it's um, just a couple of powders uh, uh, one I think is uh, silver chloride anyway it uh, I had some left over and uh, I've just silvered the ends it's a very thin layer of silver uh, it uh, wouldn't last five minutes uh, if you were handling it all the time but this has uh, been lacquered over the top uh, so I'm quite pleased with that now the wood itself is a bit of a problem because I needed a hardwood and the local emporium didn't sell any um, <coughs> so what I've done is I've recently bought a, a garden tool with a nice thick hard wood handle so I chopped a lump off the end of that um, it's normally a beech or ash but I think this by the smell when I cut it uh, is a pitch pine but hopefully uh, it'll be okay well there's the extension uh, quite pleased with that colour match is good and uh, it's nice and rigid I joined it together with a piece of uh, brass tubing uh, <coughs> super glued again and now it's it's nice and steady and there's no shifting so now all I've got to do now is to work out how to do the wiring into the bocal uh, this will fit in there nicely the problem with this is the the hole on the end is just too small to take the cable so I've got a bit of fiddling to do there but we'll see what happens wiring in the reading light uh, presents one or two little problems the first one is the wires coming out of the tube here are ordinary lighting wires they're quite thin but the socket I'm going to use is this GU10 and it's porcelain and the wires coming out the back are fiberglass covered so it looks as though it's meant to get or expected to get hot uh, it presents another problem in that whatever uh, method I got for holding it I've got to try and make it rigid so that I can push a bulb in and the second thing is I've got to fit a switch of some sort well I've solved that problem because um, at the local hardware emporium they were selling these um, four pounds quite cheap multiple colors and of course just white if you want for reading um, you can set it to the intensity so that should solve the problem of the switch it's just the mounting of it now uh, all the brass tubing I have is too small so it looks like I'm going to have to roll my own I rolled the tube and when you when you do roll a tube there's always a tendency for the two ends to become flat but uh, if you set the, the roller very carefully to the right size and you've got your diameter and the, the circumference of uh, the brass exactly right then you should be able to roll it round and round and round and it will take the flats out then the next thing of course is to make sure that the two edges mate exactly then there's no fiddling about now the, that's where the join is down there but you can't actually see it 
and even with the lens it doesn't show the only time it will show of course is when it tarnishes and the silver line a very thin silver silver solder line will show anyway the size I've made is for this to be a, a press fit a push fit in there so it'll be quite tight that should hold it rigid enough but the next, the next problem I, I have really is that I've got to drill a hole in here so that I can solder the two together, join the two together but this metal is so thin and that's a very small hole that's going to be a very weak joint so the next thing to do is to make up a collar which will fit on here and when that solders onto the tube that will give a much bigger surface area <coughs> and will make a, um, a stronger job the difficulty of course is that you've got to cope with first of all the angle and the circumference on that surface so that's going to take a bit of fiddling and a bit of filing but not impossible okay I've made the piece to go on the end uh, there's a lot of it will have to be by sight by eyesight lining up carefully the one of the problems was that the vocal of course is a, a tapered tube so the hole through there um, I used one of my brooches that I had left over from my clock making days uh, one of these five sided things and now that fits nicely on there and it leaves just a little piece sticking out uh, which is the size of the hole that I will drill in the uh, tube but I'm going to silver solder it onto the bocal first uh, before I do it into the tube I don't want to do it all as one go I cut a taper on it uh, which made life more difficult but it looks a lot better I think well there it is finished I've uh, got a reasonable fillet round there once it's held in position it's quite easy to solder now it's all cleaned up the next job is to turn the brass into a silver colour and uh, so I thought I'd just show how simple that is I've got two lots of powders this is uh, silver nitrate or got silver nitrate in it not silver chloride this on the, in this particular make you'd use a, a damp uh, bit of cotton wool get some crystals on and you just work it in like this and gradually you will see it change colour Now normally you'd um, rinse it off under the tap but I'll just use a bit of water on it for the moment and then the, you have a second lot of powder which is done in the same way and this will f complete the process now I haven't done that very thoroughly I've only done just a, a little piece and again when it's washed off it uh, 
you can see, or I hope you can see, that it has changed into a, a silver colour. I will spend more time on that particular piece because I can see um, where the sanding marks are underneath. I want to lose those. There it is. Um, I've lacquered it to stop it tarnishing because it would go black just like silver does in time. But I'm quite pleased with that. I completed the wiring and the socket uh, pushed right up inside so it doesn't show and I left a hole in the top in the cap to let the heat out. That was the theory um, but it looked as though something were missing so I tapped a thread in it and finished it off with this little brass finial. Okay well there's the finished lamp. I solved the problem of the shade uh, the local emporium had 240 shades, none of which were suitable for an uplighter. But this one uh, I happened to find is a mixing bowl. They were selling three of them in the local supermarket for 10 quid. They're stainless steel. Ah, and the biggest one is about the right size. I did find the name of the maker on the instrument. It's a Lafleur imported by Boozy and Hawks from Czechoslovakia, which means it's a pre-war model. It was uh, surprising how many, I won't call them factories, workshops that were making bassoons in a very small region of Czechoslovakia at that time. I thought it was going to be a very short lamp, but in actual fact it's a perfect height and the reading lamp at the side that swivels but of course I can't adjust the height I can't help wondering how much it would fetch if it were for sale in one of those posh London art galleries anyway that's the job done my daughter is happy I'm happy thanks for watching take care well, it's not quite as unique as I thought. Somebody, uh, a company in America, will sell you a bassoon lamp for $750. <coughs> Admittedly, it's only one lamp, and it doesn't have the reading lamp at the side. Ah, but there you go. Remember, nothing's new. Somebody's always thought of it first. And now somebody's gone and given me this clarinet, which apparently has long passed its use-by date. Oh, I have to think about what to do with that.